Hey everybody, and welcome to our very first video lecture for group schemes. The topic today is going to be quotients. As we go along in the video, feel free to pause in order to think about what we just talked about or to update your notes. This is particularly important because with this video medium, it's a lot easier to present information much faster than would be presented in the lecture. So the first question I want to think about here is what is a quotient? In topology, this has a very specific answer. What we're doing there is we're thinking about a surjective map of topological spaces, say pi going from a topological space x to a topological space y, such that two properties hold. First, we want the map to be surjective. And secondly, we want the open subsets of y to be exactly those sets whose primages are open in x. And these are the two properties that define a quotient. Things are a little bit more complicated with more uh, with topological spaces that have additional structure, for example, for smooth manifolds, because then we want our quotient space to also have the same structure, that is, a manifold structure. So for smooth manifolds, we like to think about the idea of a submersion. A submersion here is again a subjective morphism from some smooth manifold X to some smooth manifold Y, but which is locally simply a projection. By this we mean if I choose any point P and X and let Q be the corresponding image of P under pi, then I can choose local charts in a neighborhood of P and Q so that the induced map by pi is exactly a, a classical projection. In other words, there exists an open embedding of RM into X as well as an open bedding of Rn into Y, so that the corresponding map making the following diagram commute defines a projection, which is just a simple projection map here, taking an m tuple to an n tuple by forgetting the last m minus n terms. The upper triangle here just says that this local chart will be a neighborhood of P, and this bottom triangle here says the same thing but for Q. So morally speaking, submersions are simply local projections. You can have an analogous, excuse me, an analogous construction in algebraic geometry. But in order to make this in algebraic geometry, we need to translate two properties. We need to decide what it means to be surjective, and we also need to decide what it means to be locally a projection. And let's start out with this very first question. The property of being a surjection turns out to have a very nice module theoretic interpretation. To get to this, I want to talk a little bit more about some algebraic geometry. And specifically, I want to remember that associated to any ring A, I can think about the set of maximal ideals, often denoted M spec of A. Since the preimage of a maximal ideal under a homomorphism is always a maximal ideal, I have a natural map between maximal spectra for any homomorphism of rings. That is to say, if I start out with a homomorphism from A to B, and I have an induced map between maximal spectra, which just sends a maximal ideal of B, N, say, to the preimage of N under phi. So with this correspondence in mind, we can give a module theoretic criteria for this map between maximal ideal spectra to be surjective. The following theorem gives that criteria specifically. If I start out with a ring homomorphism from A to B, then the induced map of maximal ideal spectra is surjective if and only if the corresponding functor defined by tensor products going from the category of A modules to the category of A modules is faithful. And by faithful, what we mean here is that when I, when I extend scalars to B and I get zero, the thing that I started out with had to have been zero. Let's try to prove this proposition. To start out, let's suppose that the map from M spec B to M spec A is not surjective. This means that there must be some maximal ideal of A, but not in the image. So for some maximal ideal of A, I have something which is not the inverse image of some maximal ideal in B. Now, let's think for a second about the ideal phi of M B. This is some ideal of B, and if I have any ideal of B which is maximal and contains this ideal, then the preimage of that ideal would actually have to be a maximal ideal in A containing M. Since M itself is maximal, that can't happen, just because M is not in the image. 
of this map, uh, map between maximal ideal spectra is that phi m b is not contained in any maximal ideal. And there's only one ideal that's not contained in any maximal ideal. That's the whole ring. So we get that phi m b has to be b. But this is a big problem because now we can check that the tensor product of b over a with a mod m this is exactly isomorphic to b mod phi m b which we now know to be zero this means that the tensoring up with b is not faithful So this proves one direction. To prove the other direction, we'll start out with the assumption that tensoring up with B is not faithful. In other words, there's some module in the category of A modules which is non-zero, but such that the tensor product with B over A is zero. Since M is not zero, it contains a non-zero element. And I can identify the sub-module, the sub-A module of M generated by V with a quotient of A in the obvious way. Now since V is not zero, I know that I is not zero. Excuse me, I is not uh, the whole ring A. So what I can do is I can choose a maximal ideal that contains i. Then the map that sends a mod i to a mod m is clearly subjective. And when I tensor this up with b, it has to remain subjective. Just because tensor product is right exact. Moreover, since A mod I can be identified with a submodule of M, this latter module is contained in the tensor product of B over A with M, which we assume to be zero. In other words, the zero module is going to surject onto this rightmost module. So what we know is that B tensored over A with a mod m is equal to zero. And now if you note that this tensor product is isomorphic to b mod the ideal generated by the image of m, this implies that b times phi of m has to be b. Now, by the same reasoning as before, this implies that M is not in the image of the map between the maximal ideal spectra. In other words, M is not phi inverse of N for any maximal ideal N of B. Therefore, the map between the maximal ideal spectra is not surjective, and that proves the opposite direction. So we can put a little victory box. To sum up, what we've shown is that being surjective is the same thing as the corresponding tensor functor being faithful still need to come up with an interpretation of what it means to be locally a projection. So let's look at that. To think about that the right way, I want to think back to that diagram that I drew before where I was talking about submersions. The difference here is that morphisms between schemes correspond to maps between, oh sorry, morphisms between affine schemes correspond to maps between rings going in the opposite way. So all the arrows are going to be reversed. So here's that diagram again in the smooth case. And for simplicity here, let's go ahead and assume that our base field is algebraically closed. The topological spaces, or smooth manifolds x and y, will now be replaced by rings. And the map between rings is going to go in the opposite direction. So we'll have a ring A and a ring B, and an arrow going between them upwards rather than downwards. Another big difference is that the local neighborhoods will not necessarily look like Euclidean space. 
they'll look like specks of some other rings. But there's a very nice tool to think about a neighborhood of a particular point, and that's to just localize. So to get a ring that represents the neighborhood of a point, I'm just going to look at the local ring. And a point is going to correspond to a maximal ideal. So I'm going to go ahead and choose a maximal ideal M in A, and look at the localization A sub M. And I'm thinking about that as an open neighborhood of, that, of the corresponding point in the maximal ideal spectrum. And of course, there's a map from the ring to its localization. Again, we're noticing that the arrow is reversed. And our open immersion is being replaced with a localization map. The point itself, the inclusion of the point itself into the maximum ideal spectrum corresponds to an arrow going the other way to just a copy of the base field K. given by quotienting out by the maximal ideal M. Similarly, I could take the pre-image of this point and some maximal ideal up top and do the same procedure. And we have a map going from the localization to the corresponding quotient. As we did in the previous proof, let's go ahead and call this morphism of rings phi. And let's choose a, a maximal ideal N. whose pre-image is M. Then up top I have the localization of B at N, a map going from the ring B to its localization, and of course a copy of the base field. And these maps are defined by quotient out by N. Because the pre-image of N is M, I have a natural map going from AM to BN, induced by phi. And just as before, the corresponding diagram commutes. So what we want here is we want this map between local rings to somehow be like a projection. Let's think a little bit more about what projections should kind of look like in the land of algebraic geometry. The natural analog in algebraic geometry of Rn is An affine n space. The points here correspond to n tuples, or for am, m tuples of complex numbers, or more generally numbers in a field. And the natural projection here then just takes an m tuple to an n tuple by forgetting the last m minus n term. This is a morphism of schemes, of affine schemes, so it should correspond to some sort of morphism of rings going the other direction. And of course it does. AN is represented by my base field with variables x1 through xn. And AM is again represented by my base field with variables x1 through xn, xn plus 1, through xm. And the natural map here is just the inclusion map. And I just want to think about the module structure of this guy over this guy. And it's a very nice module. In particular, it's free. So our idea is to replace the condition that things should locally be, be a projection with the condition that they should be locally free. In other words, Bn should be a free AM module. When that condition is true for all M and N, what we say is we say that B is a locally free A module. That doesn't mean that it's free. It means that when we localize at any particular maximum ideal and look at the picture there, it becomes free. This translates into specifically the condition that B is a flat A module.
And what this means is that the functor, going from the category of A modules to the category of A modules, by sending a module M to the tensor over B, uh, uh, with B over A of M, is exact. That's the definition of a module being flat. So this gives us exactly the criteria that we want to define a quotient. We say that a morphism of rings from A to B is a quotient if the map taking M to B tensored over A with M is exact and that same map is also faithful. So I need that functor to be faithfully exact. Getting back to the notion of group scheme, a morphism from G to H of between group schemes is a quotient if the corresponding map of coordinate rings is a quotient. One of the nice things we can prove is that a morphism of group schemes, which is a quotient map, and also injective, has to be an isomorphism. To prove this, I'm first going to establish a lemma that shows that faithfully flat maps are injective. To prove this lemma, let's think about the kernel of the map from A to B. Now let's assume that A to B is faithfully flat. If I tensor this up with B over A, then I end up with, with a sequence going K tensor A with B into A tensored over A with B into B tensored over A with B. And this is still an exact sequence because I'm assuming that A to B is flat and therefore tensoring up with B is exact. Now the middle term here is isomorphic to B and the corresponding map here sends a B to one tensor B which is injective. And this implies that the kernel, this kernel has to be zero. So what we get is that k tensored over a with b is zero. And since we are, know that a to b is faithful, this actually implies that the kernel itself is zero. So the map from a to b must have been injective. Now using that, we can prove that a homomorphism of affine group schemes, which is both injective and a quotient map, is going to be an isomorphism. The proof is very straightforward. Remember that being an injective homomorphism of affine group schemes means that the corresponding map of coordinate rings is surjective. Furthermore, the map going from G to H being a quotient means that the corresponding map of coordinate rings oh, and I do have a typo here, OH to OG is faithfully flat. which we've just shown implies that it's injective. So it's surjective and injective, and therefore an isomorphism. And that implies that the morphism from G to H is an isomorphism. The next thing we want to show is that a quotient map between affine group schemes satisfies a universal property akin to the same universal property for quotients for groups that we learned in a first year course in algebra. So to get started here, let's consider some quotient map 
whose kernel is given by a normal subgroup n. If I have any other morphism from some affine group G to affine group H, whose kernel contains n, then there exists a unique map going from Q to H so that the corresponding diagram commutes. In other words, a quotient map satisfies a universal property for quotient groups. One obvious consequence is that quotient groups are determined uniquely up to isomorphism by their kernels. That is to say that if I have two quotient maps with the same kernel, then they'll be isomorphic. Let's try to prove the theorem. To prove this theorem, let's consider the fiber product G cross over Q with G. Remembering here that Q is a quotient of G. So there's a nice associated diagram. Like so. On the ring side, this gives us a, a diagram with the arrows going the opposite direction. Going from OG tensored over OQ with OG and OG over here OG down below and an OQ over here and the arrows are all reversed And now the key ingredient I want to use just from commutative ring theory is that if I have any ring B and maps, let's actually do this in a different color, any ring B and maps going to OG and OG, making the outermost diagram commute, then there is a unique map going from B to OQ so that the corresponding diagram commutes. Consequently, on the group scheme side, if I've got a group scheme H, and I have maps going from G to H and G to H, so that the outermost diagram commutes, then there exists a morphism of group schemes, a unique morphism of group schemes, making the following diagram commute. So all I really need to do is I need to double check that the outermost diagram commutes here. And let's think about that. If R is any particular K algebra, I know that G crossed over Q with G of R is the same thing as GR crossed over QR with GR and this is the collection of all tuples, g, g prime, and g, r cross g, r. Such that their images inside of Q agree. This says exactly that g inverse of g prime is inside the kernel. So what that tells us is if I choose an element here, gg prime, and I go this direction, it's getting sent to the image of g prime. But if I go this direction, it's getting sent to the image of g. But both g and g prime, they differ by an element of the kernel from g to q, which is contained in the kernel from g to h. So these guys will agree on the image. So the desired homomorphism from Q to H exists. So this is a pretty good stopping part for, for today. We've managed to prove some very fundamental theorems coming from basic course in algebra and group theory, but in the context of affine group schemes. And we've also reviewed the notion of a quotient from the point of view of algebraic geometry. So we'll stop there, and I'll see you guys next time.